श्रीमती बी जी रमा प्रिंसिपल चर्च मंडिया डिस्ट्रिक्ट श्री चंद्रमौली बी आर वाइस चेयरमैन कर्नाटका स्टेट बार काउंसिल दो इन एबसेंशिया श्री एच एल विशा विशाल रघु बेब्ब कर्नाटका स्टेट बार काउंसिल दि प्रेसिडेंट एंड ऑफिस बेरस ऑफ द मंडिया डिस्ट्रिक्ट एडवोकेट्स एसोसिएशन दि ऑफिस बेरस ऑफ ऑल दि अदर एसोसिएशन तालूक एडवोकेट्स एसोसिएशन एंड ऑल दि एडवोकेट्स बोथ लर्न इथ सीनियर काउंसिल Shrimati Nalina Maigauda and other senior council and all learned members of the board who have gathered here today members of the press and electronic media distinguished invitees ladies and gentlemen i hope i have not left out anybody else all of them are distinguished invitees vayuktukavagi ivattu namge bahala hemmeya dina ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತೈದನೇ ಜೂನ್ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಪ್ಪತ್ತನೇ ಇಸ್ವಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ನಮ್ಮ ತಂದೆ ಅವರು ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ ನ್ಯಾಯಾಧೀಶರಾಗಿ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ವಚನ ಸ್ವೀಕರಿಸಿದ್ರು ಆ ದಿನ ಯಾರೋ ಒಬ್ರು ಹೀಗೆ ವಿಶ್ ಮಾಡ್ ಅವರು ಒಂದು ಹೂವಿನ ತಕ್ಕಡಿ ತಂದ್ಕೊಟ್ರು ನಮ್ಮ ತಂದೆಗೆ ಅಪ್ಪ ಇದೇನಪ್ಪ ಈ ತಕ್ಕಡಿ ಎಂದೆ ಹೂವಿಂದು ಎಲ್ಲ ಇಷ್ಟು ದೊಡ್ಡ ತಕ್ಕಡಿ ಹೂವಿನ ಹೂನಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರು ಅದು ನ್ಯಾಯ ಅಂದ್ರು ಆ ನ್ಯಾಯದ ಗುರಿಯೇ ನನ್ನ ಗುರಿ ಐವತ್ತೆರಡು ವರ್ಷದಲ್ಲಿ ಹೇಳಿದ ಮಾತು ನನ್ನ ಮನ್ಸಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಹಾಗೆ ಉಳಿದಿದೆ ಆದ್ರಿಂದ ಇವತ್ತು ನನ್ನ ತವರಿನ ಜಿಲ್ಲೆ ಮಂಡ್ಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಸಕ್ಕರ ಪಟ್ಟಣ ಮಂಡ್ಯದಲ್ಲಿ ತಾವೆಲ್ಲರೂ ಬರ್ಮಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ನನ್ನನ್ನು ಹಾಗೂ ಬಾರ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಅವರ ಜೊತೆ ಈ ಮೆಮೋರಿಯಲ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಎ ಎಸ್ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀ ಸಾಗರ್ ಅವರ ಮೆಮೋರಿಯಲ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಗೆ ಬರಮಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ನನ್ನನ್ನು ಕರೆಸಿದಕ್ಕೆ ಹಾಗೂ ಆನರ್ ಮಾಡಿದಕ್ಕೆ ನಾನು ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಆಭಾರಿ the karnataka state bar council has done a yeoman service by instituting this memorial lecture in the name of a great teacher sri a lakshmi sagar i thank the karnataka state bar council and mandya district advocates association for inviting me to deliver the professor a lakshmi sagar memorial lecture on this occasion i would like to pay my tribute to professor a lakshmi sagar an academician advocate social activist and former minister for law and parliamentary affairs government of karnataka i am honored to be delivering this lecture in memory of a visionary who dedicated his life and career towards championing the cause of social justice his personal philosophy which guided his crusading endeavors was that social justice was the central theme and the signature tune of the constitution of india and that achievement of social justice should be the goal of public service professor a lakshmi sagar had an astute mind whose keen thinking has been channelized towards redressing issues at various levels to ensure welfare of citizens during his term as the minister for law and parliamentary affairs government of karnataka he was well known and admired among other noble traits for his munificence he shared knowledge and anything else that he had to offer to the world he is also looked at with adulation for his humility warmth and amiability i had the good fortune of meeting professor a lakshmi sagar sometime in the 1970s and apart from that his house was very close to my office kesvian company in gandhinagar i used to always see his small very small name board he had outside his house when i used to go to my office uh, in the late 80s and early 90s i personally believe 
that what made Professor A. Lakshmi Sagar a successful teacher or an ideal teacher was because he was also a good statesman and he possessed the unique ability to impart knowledge which would enhance the core values of society. Thus, Professor A. Lakshmi Sagar was one such ideal teacher and statesman. To sum up, I would say that Professor A. Lakshmi Sagar left an indelible and distinct mark on law and life. I congratulate the Karnataka State Bar Council and its members for having instituted a memorial lecture series in his revered memory. Given that social justice was the central piece of Professor Lakshmi Sagar's personal philosophy, I thought of delivering a talk on the theme of women empowerment as a shared vision of social justice as well as human rights. And hence my topic is the evolution of women's right to property in India, facet of women's empowerment. The narrative of women's empowerment would be incomplete without referring to the aspect of ownership of land and property by women. Women's access to property is a crucial determinant of more equitable gender patterns of wealth distribution, household bargaining power and decision making. Studies by development economics suggest that securing women's property rights and inheritance rights are among the most effective means of achieving women's empowerment, particularly in developing countries. Therefore, laws and policies that seek to improve the position of women relative to men in matters of right to property and inheritance have been advocated and endorsed in addition to those which seek to improve economic opportunities for women. Although we have the Uniform Civil Court as a directive principle of state policy under Article 44 of the Constitution, we cannot escape the fact that under Article 15.3 of the Constitution, there is permission for special rights and protections to be extended to women in order to secure that they are protected from any manifestation of discrimination. Such constitutional protection is to be borne in mind while enacting, applying or interpreting any law which has implications on the rights of women, even though such laws are based on personal law systems. In India, property rights of women have evolved out of a continuing struggle between what I call the status quo and the progressive thinkers. In fact, when we come to think of the property rights of women, we notice that they are governed by different personal laws based on religion and which is a facet of our pluralistic society in India with its multiculturalism as well as secularism. The same also has an implication on specific gendered rights in family life. I will therefore briefly discuss the discourses, legislations and judicial pronouncements which dictate property rights of women under different personal laws briefly. As far as Christian women are concerned, Section 31 to 49 of the Indian Succession Act 1925 deal with all aspects of succession and inheritance of properties insofar as Christian women are concerned. In the decision in Mary Roy versus State of Kerala, the Honorable Supreme Court in 1986 held that where a number of laws were being applicable, after the coming into force of the constitution and the Union of India being formed, question arose whether the provisions of the Travancore Christian Succession Act were ultra-virus the constitution. Another related question that was raised before the court was as to the impact of the Part B States Laws Act 1951 on the Travancore state. The Supreme Court held that uh, the after the 1st of April 1951, that is the date when the Part B States Laws Act came into effect, it was only that the Indian Succession Act which would apply to Christians. As per the Indian Succession Act, a Christian woman, whether is a widow or a daughter of the deceased, 
is entitled to a specified share. Such a share is to be determined based on the identity of other living relatives of the deceased. Another salient aspect of the law of the land as to property rights of Christian women is that a woman's property is treated as self-acquired property irrespective of the actual mode of acquisition of the same. As far as the Parsi women are concerned, section 50 to 56 of the Indian Succession Act deal with the law of succession applicable to Parsis. As far as Parsis are concerned, there is equal distribution of property between the sons and daughters and a widow of a deceased Parsi male who dies interstate. The share of a daughter is not affected by her marital status. Each parent of the deceased would also be entitled to half the share of each child. As far as the Muslim women are concerned, in the Islamic scheme of inheritance, there are three basic features. First, the Quran confers specific shares to specified category of individuals. Second, the residue devolves upon the agnetic heirs or at the absence thereof on uterine heirs. Third, bequests are limited by law to one third of an individual's estate. Under the Islamic law, a wife is also recognized as an heir on the death of her spouse. The law entitles females and cognates to inherit property. Parents, including mothers and lineal descendants, including females, are given priority in matters of inheritance, even when there are male descendants. However, under Islamic laws of inheritance, a descendant daughter is eligible to claim a share equal only to half of the share of a son. A Muslim woman governed by the Muslim power personal laws is entitled to claim one-eighth of her husband's property if the couple had children and one-fourth of her husband's property if the couple did not have children. Another interesting feature of Mormon law governing the property rights of women is in relation to the nature of a claim a woman has over meher. Her right is that of an unsecured creditor and the claim may be satisfied out of her deceased husband's estate to the exclusion of claims of other heirs. This right is recognized as the widow's right of retention. As far as the tribal women are concerned, you know the case of Madhu Kishwar versus state of Bihar where the question regarding the property rights of tribal women were considered in relation to the customary laws, laws the Supreme Court held that the tribal women would succeed to the estate of their parent, brother, husband or heirs by interstate succession and inherit property as per the general principles of Hindu Succession Act 1956 as amended from time to time. Even a tribal Christian women's right is governed by the Indian Succession Act. As a result, the Apex Court has emphasized on the need for gender justice to permeate and benefit even tribal women are concerned. Now as far as the Hindu women are concerned, it is known that in Vedic age, a Hindu a woman was worshipped, but she was always under her paternal control or the control of the husband or that of her children. From the writings of various schools, it can be noted that after some time, the widow, mother and daughter were included in the list of heirs. But Manu, in his Manuspriti said, and I quote, her father protects her in childhood, her husband protects her in youth, and her sons protect her in old age. A woman is never fit for independence. Today, and in this age, I would like to say, that a society should protect every woman. Restrictions on Hindu women's property rights have undergone change and current laws governing these rights are more liberal than those of ancient Hindu society. Earlier, her property was equivalent to her Sridhana and she hardly had any rights in the ancestral property or in the marital property. But with the passage of time, there has been a change. Mithakshara, a commentary on the Yajna Malkya Spriti, authored by Vitna Neshwara, 
has emerged as the foremost authority on rules of inheritance by birth in Banaras, the south and west of India, whereas Jimuth Mahana's Dayabaga is prevalent in the Bengal region. Mithila, Banaras, Bombay and Dravida are the subdivisions of the Mitakshara school. It is this branch of law which has now been metamorphosed to give a greater scope for property rights as far as women are concerned. To this learned audience, I need not describe what is co-pastory property, what is joint family property and what is ancestral property, etc. But the Hindu Law of Inheritance Amendment Act 1929 involved certain female members being granted the right to succession. Son's daughter, daughter's daughter and sisters were recognized as heirs. Prior to that, it was only in the classical Madras and Bombay rules or principles. Over a period of time, various laws were enacted by seeking to confer new rights and enhance existing rights in favor of women over property. The Hindu Women's Right to Property Act 1937 was enacted, which crystallized the property rights of a widow in the event that her husband died intestate. The legislation posited that a widow would be entitled to a share of property equal to that of a son of the deceased, that is under the Bombay school. However, a widow's interest in property acquired on the death of her husband was limited, meaning thereby that she had the right to enjoy the property during her lifetime, but could not dispose of the same. But it is noteworthy that in the old Mysore region to which the district of Mandya belongs, the Mysore Legislative Assembly enacted a very enlightened legislation even prior to the British India legislation of 1937, which is called the Mysore Hindu Law Women's Right Act 1933. This act conferred on the widow, the widow of a predeceased son, and the widow of a predeceased son of a predeceased son, a right of inheritance to the deceased property, even when the deceased left a male issue. Such persons were even allowed to claim partition, even though they would be entitled only to a limited estate in the property of the deceased. Under the Mysore Act, the women enjoyed the absolute right to deal with their sridhana, either to dispose it of during their lifetime or through a will. The Hindu Succession Act 1956 is the harbinger of enhanced property rights to women. Section 14 of the 1956 Act confers absolute right in favour of a Hindu woman in relation to any property acquired by her before or after the commencement of the Act. The Supreme Court in the case of V. Kulsamma Reddy versus Shesha Reddy has held that the widow is entitled to pay credits out of her husband's estate irrespective of whether the estate is in the hands of his male issue or other co-partners. The court further held that where the widow receives property in view of her rate debts and her compromise before the Act, her limited rights mature into absolute rights. Therefore, the rights of a Hindu woman over property held by her are unfettered and include the right to dispose of the property by way of a will or by sale subject to exceptions under Section 14 of the Act. But the main issue is, how does she get that property? The devolution of property is more important rather than how she deals with it later on. As we have already noted under Hindu Succession Act 1956, two departures were made with regard to the classical Hindu law. First was the introduction of the device of notional partition that is, if a male co-pastor died and the Mitakshara law being applicable to him with an undivided interest in the joint family property, then, and if he had left behind any female heir or a male heir claiming under such female heir mentioned in class 1 of the schedule to the act, then the doctrine of survivorship would not be applicable and the notion of notional partition would be applicable. Applying the concept of notional partition, the female heirs were given a share in the property that falls to the share of the deceased co-pastor, 
as if the partition had taken place a day prior to his death. A male co-pastor's interest in co-pastory property is the share that would be allotted to such co-pastor upon a partition if it had taken place immediately before his death. Therefore, the term notional partition. Section 6 as it stood immediately after the enforcement of the 1956 Act gave certain rights in the joint family property or the ancestral property in so far as the father is concerned to a limited extent only. This has been recognized by the device of notional partition which has been clearly demonstrated in the case of Gurupath Magdum versus Mirabai Magdum, which is a judgment which has been authored by Honorable Chief Justice Y.V. Chandrachud as it then was. I have already said that the second landmark change in the Succession Act is with regard to Section 14 of the Act. The third and the most important and controversial change, if I may say, but in favour of women, is daughters now being recognised as co partners under the Mitakshara school of Hindu law, no female was treated as a co pastor in a joint family. This remained so even after the Hindu Succession Act 1956 came into effect, notwithstanding that Section 6 as it then read, with Section 8 allowed several female relatives of a deceased male co pastor to inherit co pastory property. The above position was changed after nearly 50 years, with the amendments made with effect from 99. 2005. But as far as the state of Karnataka is concerned, <coughs> including the states of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, the right of women, that is daughters as co-pastors was recognized as early as in the 90s. The state amendments recognized the right of daughters in co-pastory property by birth. Such daughters were given the same rights as sons and subject to the same liabilities. However, daughters married prior to the enforcement of the state amendments were not treated as co partners Thus, marriage of daughters was a reference point to deny a share of a share equal to that of the sons. But as I told you, with the amendment brought about in the year 2005, that restriction of married daughters being denied a share or being treated as co partners equivalent to that of sons, has been done away with. The distinction between married and unmarried daughters introduced by the state amendments has been excluded, and to that extent, the state amendment is now repugnant. After the enforcement of the amendment to Section 6, what are the two aspects which emerge? The first is with regard to the daughter being a co pastor in her own right from birth, irrespective of when she was born, whether prior to the Succession Act being enforced or after the Act being enforced, prior to the amendment being enforced or after the amendment being enforced. She is on par as a son, that is, her right to ancestral property is from the date of her birth. Of course, this declaration is once again qualified. If there has been any partition which has taken place prior to December 28, 2004, then the amendment would not apply. The reason being, the parliament being anxious to save all partitions which have taken place prior to 20th December 2004. That is the day when the bill was introduced in the parliament. The second is, that under subsection 2 of section 6, the property to which a female Hindu becomes entitled by virtue of the amendment shall be held by her with the incidence of co pastory ownership and shall be regarded notwithstanding anything contained in the Act or any other law for the time being in force as property capable of being disposed of by her by testamentary disposition. This has to be read, in my view, along with section 14 of the Act and harmoniously. Since daughters are recognized as co pastors by birth, but the amendment introduced brought up certain questions before the courts. 
to this august audience i need not go into each of those decisions except refer to them devli prakash versus kulwati danamma versus amar and mangammal versus tv raju what happened afterwards there is a conflict between the decisions in danamma on the one hand and mangammal and kulwati on the other therefore the matter was referred to a larger bench and the question reference was answered in vinita sharma versus rakesh sharma where the court held that do the rights are with effect from 99 2005 which is a declaration the provision is retroactive in application the benefits are conferred on the female that is a daughter from her birth and not from 99 2005 as such therefore the judgment in prakash versus kulwati was overruled i don't want to go in detail to the judgment in vinita sharma authored by uh, a bench of three judges and justice arun mishra who has authored it but on an analysis what happens is that certain positions of law have become clear namely that the daughter would become a co-pastor by virtue of the amendment act and such right would relate back to her birth irrespective of her, of her date of birth daughters have to be given a share even though the suit for partition has been filed or severance of status has occurred prior to the amendment so long as property has not been partitioned by actual division in meets and bounds now we all know under the classical law of partition once there is a signal made or an indication given that a co-pastor wants to separate or divide then the joint family no longer survives as such the joint tenancy becomes tenancy in common but even though it becomes tenancy in common the supreme court says until the final decree is passed where the properties are divided by meets and bounds the amendment made to section 6 would have to be applied in other words in all pending cases where even if a preliminary decree has been made by the court at the time of drawing up of the final decree the amendment has to be taken into consideration this is as per the analogy that if between a preliminary decree and a final decree there are births the share goes down and if there are deaths the share goes up now between the preliminary and the final decree if the amendment is taken into consideration then the daughters have to be given a share equal to that of the sons then there has to be a redrawing of another preliminary decree which is permissible even at the time of a final decree proceeding and the properties have to be divided equally that is the scope and ambit of the amendment to section 6 and judgment also and in holding so what the court said in nilita sharma was to make a departure in the earlier decision in uttam versus saubak singh in uttam versus saubak singh the supreme court had said that once the notional partition takes place that is the end of the joint family that is not the end of the joint family the notional partition is only in so far as the deceased co-pastor is concerned his share gets crystallized the day before he died as far as the rest of the family is concerned they continue to remain joint that is the uh, dictum of uh, the supreme court in vinita sharma and in coming to this the supreme court relied upon ganduri koteshwaramma's case and s sai reddy versus s narayan reddy's case in that case the andhra pradesh amendment was taken into consideration and it was held that the shares would have to be redetermined keeping in mind the amendment made at the time of the final decree the question regarding the applicability of 2005 amendment to pending suits was also considered and as i already said that the law operating on the date of passing of the final decree would be applicable that is the amendment now made with effect from 99 2005 based on the above discussion it is fairly clear that, that the law is undergone reformation and evolution to overcome systemic discrimination against women in my view the real objective of a legal regulation 
should be to change social and particularly gender attitudes. Such attitudinal changes are essential, which are based on an understanding that the changes in law targeted to provide enhanced rights to women were demanded by social changes or societal changes. Male co partners should have an enlightened attitude which recognizes the need, interests and rights of the female counterparts. Sensitization to bring about such attitudinal change is the need of the hour. You know, the moment the son is born, we always feel that Vamsha Belitu unta. Ida Magal Uttadru, Vamsha Belitu unta ne na one kobe. Bari Maga Uttadru, Vamsha Belitu unta helvan. Property kobe ko unta hala, but an attitudinal change, a sensitivity must be there apart from giving a right equal to that of a son. While the discourse today has been predominantly on one aspect of women empowerment, that is, through vesting of property rights, women ought to be guarded by law in a multitude of areas, namely, as far as their safety, health, profession, labor, etc. is concerned. Having stated the systemic discrimination against women from a long time and the law now trying to see that such discrimination is removed, I wish to say one thing. Being a woman, being a daughter, I would like to make this submission. See, it is true that in one area of law there is an empowerment. A daughter is treated equal to a son. But at the same time, it is not necessary that this right given to a daughter must always be enforced. Many a time we come across during the course of our adjudication that the daughters, the sisters are better placed than the brothers or the sons. Even then, their daughters are very adamant to invoke this section 6 and claim a share. I am, please do not mistake me, especially daughters and women in this gathering or anybody who is listening to this in other platforms or offline or online or whatever. What I say is that no doubt the law has recognized you as equivalent to a son, but at the same time, the parents would have educated you, the brothers and parents would have sacrificed they have got you married, they have spent for your education and they take all care about you, not just up to the date of marriage, but even after marriage. A brother is the one who always helps a sister in need. Therefore, my submission and appeal to women is that who, are, who have this right, not to insist upon this right in to full 100%. No doubt, you are entitled to this right. You can claim this right. There are many women who are in need of this kind of support. I am not speaking as regards such people, but daughters, sisters who are well off, who are better than their brothers, who are better, th better off than their father or parents, must not always say, I want my pound of flesh. The moment, the moment a partition suit is filed, what happens? Taurmane Viruddha Dava Hakadra Yena Gatte Adi Ili Uttara Jille Galali Ellar Tu Namge Artha Gatte Adi Kos Karane Gan Maklu Hen Maklu Ella Seri Allale Vyajya Na Ityatta Matko Beko Court Ke Dava Hakle Bardu Tande Hodre Adi En Barbeko Hen Magal Ke Adan Korbeko Anna Tambiru Korbeko Adi Riti Akka Tambiru और के निचवागलो अद आवश्यकते इधरे अदन ना केल पड़ी, but आवश्यकते इधरे इधरों नो दावा हाथी व्याजा मारी कुटुंबा वर्ड दो ये सोसाइटी यल्ली घोप ताय दे ऐसा ना बाहरा योजना आगे देखो। Therefore an attitudinal change is required, not only in the male members of the family but also the female members। ये बात लोक अदालत नडी ताय दे, ये पार्टीशन सूट कल लोकल दालत के रेफर मारी दारो एल्वा गोतीला, नमः वकील मित्र रे लिदारे, और कौन मनवी
ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ಸೂಟ್ನ ಬೇಗ ಇತ್ಯರ್ಥ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ರೀತಿಲಿ ಕಾಂಪ್ರಮೈಸ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲೋಕ ಅದಾಲತ್ತು ಮೀಡಿಯೇಷನ್ ಅಲ್ಲೋ ಸೆಟ್ಲ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಸಂಸಾರದಲ್ಲಿ ಎಲ್ಲ ಕುಟುಂಬದಲ್ಲಿ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ರೀತಿಗೆಲ್ಲ ಬಾಳ್ಲಿ ಅಂತ ನನ್ನ ಹಾರೈಕೆ ಐ ಮೈ ಅಪೀಲ್ ಟು ದ ಅಡ್ವೊಕೇಟ್ಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಟು ಎನ್ಶೋರ್ ದಟ್ ದ ಟೇಕ್ ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟರ್ ರೋಲ್ ಅ ಪಾಸಿಟಿವ್ ರೋಲ್ ಇನ್ ಎನ್ಶೋರಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಮೀಡಿಯೇಷನ್ ಆರ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಲೋಕ ಅದಾಲತ್ ಸೆಟಲ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಬಟ್ ನಾಟ್ ವಿತೌಟ್ ಎನಿ ಫ್ರಾಡ್ a real settlement in the true sense and see that the brothers and sisters are brought together the parents and the children are brought together so that you will be doing a yeoman service to so many families to so many families the empowerment is one thing but enforcement is another thing how you enforce your right is very important in what way there can be a give and take there can be a settlement so that there is a peace in the family otherwise you know how partition suits go on from generation to generation from one set of legal representatives to another set of legal representatives and there will be one or two persons in the case who are so adamant who will never agree for settlement though all others will agree for settlement my appeal to the judges and the conciliators who sit in such matters to advise the parties that importance of settlement in so far as their family life is concerned their extended family life is concerned and so that there is peace between families and also in the society therefore such attitudinal change is required even though the legislature has granted the rights in favor of women and uh, and mind it when i say attitudinal change attitudinal change in the brothers in the father and karta and male co-partners vis-a-vis the female co-partners and at the same time the female co-partners also saying that there should be some kind of a give and take particularly when they are better off than their brothers or their father this will really achieve what is an ideal gender equity in the real sense of the term so that there is peace and stability within the family and ultimately in the society i have made a long uh, lecture of 38 pages but i know the attention span of our advocates and also the audience secondly the lok adalat proceedings are on and hence uh, with this short address i once again thank the chairman office bearers and members of the karnataka state bar council for having given me this opportunity to deliver this memorial address in the name of professor a lakshmi sagar who is a great teacher and a great parliamentarian legislator and a statesman let me say by why i am also happy to deliver this uh, lecture because professor a lakshmi sagar was a great teacher this is because i would say at the end why but i would like to take one uh, departure with your kind permission that after my father got married he started studying law and there were no law colleges in old mysore area so for the first year he went to uh, ils law college pune and for the second year he went to rl law college in belgaum and he was the first person to get a first class in rl law college belgaum and he was asked to be a fellow a fellow means a junior teacher and he started his career as a law teacher and he was asked you know one uh, yeah juniors are always given tough subjects he was asked to teach roman law and uh, he had to teach roman law to his uh, to the students so he began his career as a law teacher and thereafter when he was practicing despite his tremendous practice he is went to teach in bms law college and he became the principal of that law college and thereafter he became a judge and retired as the supreme court chief justice but after retirement he went back to the national law school and taught there for 5 years holding the nambia chair which was instituted by the present attorney general shri k k venugopal so what i would like to say is inviting me to this memorial lecture of a great 
your teacher is has really made me proud because i would say that i am a proud daughter of a law teacher thank you very much namaskar ಒಂದು ಹೆಣ್ಣು ಮಗಳು ತವರು ಮನೆಗೆ ಬರುವುದೇ ಒಂದು ಸಂಭ್ರಮ ಹಾಗಿರುವಾಗ ಯಶಸ